Professor Dixon from University of Florida. He received his PhD in 2000 from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering from Clemson University. He worked as a research staff member and Eugene E. Wagner followed at the Oak Ridge National Lab until 2004. And then he joined the University of Florida Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department and he currently holds Newton C. Abroad Professorship. And his uh, main research interest has been the development and application of lipono based control techniques uh, for uncertain systems. And his work has been recognized by a number of early career best papers to mentoring uh, awards. He's a fellow of ASME and IEEE. So, uh, whenever you are ready, you are ready. Okay, thanks. Um, so, so, thank you, Kenzo, for the invitation. And thank you guys for coming and listening to the talk today. Um, the, the focus is on uh, autonomous systems um, where we may be in environments where feedback is intermittent or denied and um, that causes certain complications to happen in the control system and so we'll kind of talk through, um, I'll show you some videos of some things that we're doing to kind of accommodate for this intermittency of sensor information. There's lots of motivations for um, you know, examining intermittent sensor information. Um, you could be in a natural environment where uh, the sensor information is, is, is intermittent. Uh, think of a camera where um, it may be trying to track a target and the target goes in and out of the field of view, or um, it just, there's a sun, uh, you know, it faces the sun and it gets blinded for a moment and uh, doesn't see the target. Or more generally, and you could be in a GPS denied environment, or just GPS could be you know, uh, coming in and going out intermittently as well. Um, and so uh, there could also be cyber effects, uh, you know, in certain environments as well. And how do we build in robustness to that intermittency um, so that if we have a controller, we can ensure stability or some kind of performance certificate, or if we're using an observer, um, how do we know that we can trust the results that the observer tells us? Um, and the, the picture on the, the bottom right is, a, is an actual picture taken from a publication where um, they have a camera on a non autonomic vehicle, think of a car, and uh, it, it only knows where it is in the world by localizing to some known target, but it wants to steer around the target. And because of the kinematics of the vehicle and its motion constraints, it has to do this odd zigzag, drive forward, turn a little bit, drive backwards, drive forward a little bit, turn and drive backwards in order to keep that target in the field of view. And so there are approaches like this that, that are in literature that have uh, focused on doing things to keep the target in the field of view. And so today we'll talk about um, resiliency to the fact that the target might leave the field of view, um, where that's, a, where that's a, an effect Try and compensate for, but I'll also talk about the fact that um, that might be something that we want to exploit. So instead of um, doing odd trajectories like that in order to make sure the target remains in the field of view, if we can design the controllers or observers to allow the object to leave the field of view for some amount of time, then maybe we can exploit that to design much more natural trajectories to, uh, to traverse around or, or through an environment where then we can just intermittently get feedback. Um, when we have intermittent feedback, then that sets up a switch system or a hybrid system where when you have feedback, then um, you know, there's the assumption that you can stabilize the dynamics of the system through the feedback. Or if you have an observer, then you have feedback and your observer can be convergent. But then when you lose feedback or you're dead reckoning, uh, meaning you're just drifting based on um, some local sensing, um, then your observer can drift, it can become unstable. If you're trying to do control and you lack like feedback, it can become unstable. And so oftentimes we're switching between a stable subsystem and an unstable subsystem. And to address that, we're going to use switch systems theory, which provides us with performance certificates. Sometimes it tells us the scalability um, of the system um, and provides timing conditions. And the timing conditions are, are helpful because it lets us know, for example, how, how long I can remain or I need to remain in the stable uh, subsystem dynamics before switching into the unstable dynamics and how long I can withstand being in the unstable dynamics or without sensor information, for example, um, before I need to go back into the stable subsystem. 
Um, and even in switching between two globally exponentially stable subsystems, um, you could switch in a way that could destabilize the system, and there's famous examples of that. And so we have to, when we're doing hybrid systems theory, we have to be concerned with both the stability of the individual subsystems and the effect of the switching on the system as well. Um, so this is a picture that just kind of uh, reviews what I just said, that we could have discontinuities due to uh, sensing and communication dynamics, we could have discontinuities due to um, trying to embed some logic um, into the autonomous system or into the mission objectives that are then folded into the path planning, folded into the control, um, or the dynamics themselves can have some discontinuities. And then, as I said, we'll use switch systems to address that. Um, and when I said that the timing conditions are an important thing, and, and today we're going to look at the sensor and communication dynamics, and we're going to focus on getting performance certificates and, and, uh, and develop these timing conditions. And the timing conditions, as I said, are important because um, it may be that we uh, converge at a certain rate over a certain period of time, and then if we diverge uh, at a certain rate over a certain period of time, then these timing conditions can be used to um, ensure that overall our trend is decaying uh, so that we can, have, we can have a discussion about convergence and stability. Uh, so this is a, a, a neat little toy problem to kind of start the discussion. Um, what you see here, um, the red lines are the actual trajectories, the blue lines are the desired trajectories. We just scattered randomly five dots and we said we go to the star in the center. And uh, the, each agent uh, was completely sensorless. So it has no idea where it is, it just, it just knows uh, the, direct, the general direction of the goal and then it heads there. And because of the drift in the sensors, you see I mean, these even come and collide. Um, and so they don't achieve the objective. Um, it's pretty understandable without feedback that that would happen. And so we were motivated to understand, but, but, but this is an important problem. For example, I may have a scenario where I want to mass produce a lot of really inexpensive agents that don't have sensing uh, capabilities. I don't want to ha have to consume the power or the cost or the real estate on the uh, autonomous agent to have to deal with that. Or maybe I have some legacy systems that, that don't have uh, sensing capabilities in it, but I still want them to achieve some kind of a mission objective. Is there a way that I can use a smart agent that works among the, the sensorless agents in order to um, provide the information to the sensorless agents to allow them to achieve the objective? And so the idea here is that we're going to use this smart agent and it's going to visit and switch between the agents in order to keep them headed in the right direction and keep them um, on the mission objective. Um, so the, the smart agent in the system we call the leader. It has some dynamics. We're just going to call it a point mass dynamic. You could add in nonlinear or, or linear dynamics here if you wanted to. Um, that's a fairly straightforward extension. Um, but it's not really the focus of the problem. For the follower, we did add in some nonlinear dynamics just because, um, you know, it's used, we're going to be able to point to build observers and controllers, and that is going to be based on the dynamics of the follower. And so uh, we just put in some generic um, um, nonlinear function in there for that. And we added a disturbance um, just uh, so that you wouldn't get there perfectly with dead reckoning. Um, there's some sensor or, or kinematic disturbance to the system. Um, and then we're going to develop a simple predictor that's just based on a model um, of the dynamics. In this application, we're assuming the model is known, but in the subsequent um, um, example, I'll show you that we can also accommodate for unknown dynamics in our predictor as well. So we have different air systems that we're talking about today. Um, and this is part of the innovation strategy in having to deal with these problems. Uh, the first one is the difference between um, where I am and where I think I am. Um, that's an obvious error system that you might want to um, quantify. It's an estimation error signal. Um, the problem with that error system, though, is that we don't know where we are. So um, E1 is not a measurable error all the time. Um, 
it's only measurable, in fact, when the intelligent agent is um, within your sensing field and, or is communicating to you to let you know, hey, by the way, you're at this location. Um, the second one is the difference between the goal and where I think I am. I know where the goal is, and I always have some kind of estimate of where I think I am, and so that one is measurable all the time. And because it's measurable all the time, at least for that error system, I, can, I should be able to stabilize that. And the third error system is the difference between where the leader is and where its estimate of the other agents are. The leader knows, the leader is, is nearly omniscient. I mean, it knows its own, well, it knows its own information completely. And then it also runs an estimator of where the following agents are. Um, and what's important about these timing conditions is if I know you're going along a trajectory over there, and I'm gonna to have to leave you to go tell someone else where they are, and then I'm gonna revisit you to tell you where you are, um, I have to be able to know where you're gonna be in order for me to intersect you uh, within the certain amount of time. And so I have to predict where you're gonna be. And, and so that's an important error system to have as well. But I, I always have a prediction of where you're gonna be, and I always know where I am, so E3 is also always measurable um, to the leader. So in the leader's control, I can use that one. So um, for the controller, um, for the follower's controller, uh, we just feed forward the model of the dynamics and then some simple feedback uh, loop. Um, and, and the feedback that we're using there is the one that's always measurable to the follower. And then for the leader, um, we have the, um, um, E2 is also known to the leader because it, it has this estimate of where the followers are and it knows the goal location as well. So it has also some feedback on the error 2 system and then some feedback on the error 3 system. And so these are the closed loop error systems. The E2 and E3, since we have those error signals always, we should be able to exponentially stabilize those subsystems. And, but the first um, set of subsystem dynamics, um, because we don't always have a measurement of where we are, um, then this mismatch here can be destabilizing. So we have a potential unstable dynamic that we're gonna be switching to. And the way we set it up uh, is that we're gonna define a, a worst case scenario for how large we'll let our errors grow. Think of it as a, as a tolerance um, or a performance specification. And so then the worst case is that our errors um, our unstable error system can grow up to this user-defined threshold or tolerance and then, and then reset because we're going to be forced to, by the time the errors get that large, we're going to develop some timing conditions that ensure that I've, I've got communication before that happens and so I'll be able to reset my error system. Okay, so worst case, I'll just keep growing up to my max tolerance. Um, and after doing some analysis, um, all this is using a Lyapunov-based analysis and then using switch systems methods to develop timing conditions. And here we've developed some timing conditions. Um, here we have a maximum dwell time. Um, so this is the maximum amount of time that I can go without feedback, essentially. And it's a function of my user-defined tolerance. It's a function of uh, my convergence rate when I'm in the stability region and as a function of the divergence rate when I'm in the uh, unstable region. And so uh, this is a picture, so, so here are our dynamics. Again, we just made them a point mass because they were known anyway. Um, and then, uh, then our estimated dynamics were just the estimated position. And then we added some sinusoidal disturbances on there. Um, nothing too exciting from a dynamics perspective. Uh, but this is the trajectory of the agents. And so here you can see, even though none of the agents have sensors on them, and the only feedback that they get is when the leader uh, visits them to intermittently give them information, they all are still able to converge um, and achieve consensus. And that's what you see. Uh, this is the previous video where they have no sensors. This is the video that has the leader in there. You can see the, the leader is moving among the agents uh, to give them course correction uh, by following the timing conditions that were developed from the analysis. And here you can see that even without sensors, they're all able to converge.
And uh, this is a top-down view of the path of the leader moving among the agents. And then this is the um, air systems. And you can see that there's unstable periods where the air is grow, um, and then they reset, and this keeps happening. But the overall trend, because the way we de develop the timing conditions, the overall trend is decaying up until some point where all the agents are close enough that they're all within the center uh, radius of the leader, and then they, they always have feedback and they converge. And this was the E2 air system, which we said should be exponentially stabilizable, and the E3 air system, which we said should be exponentially stabilizable, and they are. So um, that toy problem uh, led us to thinking about um, other types of problems where we may have sensor intermittency. Um, so, so one of those problems is um, in the underwater environment. For example, if, if I am trying to scan the underwater environment for, for some targets of interest, um, in the underwater environment I don't have GPS, the physics just don't allow me to have that. So when I'm underwater, I'm, I'm basically dead reckoning. And if I just stayed underwater doing my sensing mission, eventually I would, I would be in a place that isn't where I thought I should be. And the things that I'm finding, I'm not going to be able to you know, geolocate them to anything meaningful. And so I would have to surface, come to the surface of the water, get my GPS information, and, and have that reset, and then go back under the surface of the water. So we, we simplified that problem. Uh, and examined uh, it by considering a region F, the green zone, and in F you have feedback, and then everywhere else you don't have feedback. It's a feedback denied region. And the objective is I have a desired trajectory which is always outside of the feedback region. So I want to always follow this desired trajectory, but I never have feedback there. So I have to plan some path that will take me from the green region where I have feedback to my path, and then I'll have to constantly go back and forth and revisit it based on a timing that's going to be generated from my switch analysis. Um, I have similar kind of um, error systems. Um, I have a trajectory tracking error system. I have a state estimate error system, and I have an, an estimate error. Uh, the difference between where I am and where I think I am, the difference between where I think I am and the, and the and the, and, the, and the switch trajectory, which is the trajectory which takes me to the path and back, and then the mismatch between the, the trajectory um, that's taking me to the path and back and my actual location. So uh, at first we just developed, you know, here's some generalized controller. Because again, I mean, you saw the, the previous controllers, there was nothing fancy about them. We just fed forward some trivial dynamics and then had uh, KE. On the, on the air system, and likewise here, uh, we're not going to do anything fancy with the, with the controller. We just assume it's going to have, I mean, when I can measure, I can feedback my air system E, and when I can't measure, I just have an estimate E hat. And um, for my observer, when I can measure, I have some measure of my estimation error, and when I um, am not, I'm in a region where I don't have feedback, then I don't have that observation error signal for feedback. Um, and so as long as I can design some stabilizable observer and some stabilizable controller, then that's sufficient for this discussion. Um, and again, I have in these error systems, uh, these are all should be stabilizable error systems along with this one because I can measure my feedback. Here where I can't measure my feedback, this is a potentially unstable subsystem. So again, I'm going to be switching between stable subsystems and unstable subsystems. And by doing a Lyapunov analysis, developing my timing conditions, um, in this first problem, we developed this observer so that um, we couldn't just go into the feedback region and immediately know where we were. Um, we developed an observer and we had to penetrate deep enough into the green zone so that we were ensured that our observer would converge um, before we left the green zone. This was our first attempt. There was a mathematical issue that came up in trying to use a discontinuous signal, and by using the observer to provide us this estimate and using that as a feedback signal, 
we were able to get around this discontinuity uh, math hiccup that was complicating things. In the next result I'll show you, we got past that. Um, but here, because we're using an observer, there we developed a timing condition, which is the maximum amount of time that I can go without feedback. And again, it's, it's based on different error systems, convergence rates and divergence rates. And then we also developed a, a, a condition, a timing condition that says you must remain in the feedback region sufficiently long so that my observer converges to a certain point before I'll let you leave the, um, the feedback region again. Um, so here was a specific control design that, that met these, the, the conditions from the previous analysis and a specific observer design uh, that met the conditions of our previous analysis. Um, and so here's a video that shows this. Um, so this is a quadcopter, it's a parrot bebop. Um, we're tracking its position with a motion capture system. Um, this gray area in here is the feedback region. And then this outer black circle is the um, our desired trajectory and it's in the feedback denying region. And in this region, you'll see green. That's when we actually have state feedback. And then, um, so you can see the observer converged whenever we got back in the green region. And then when we're out here, um, this blue is our, um, our trajectory that's taking us, that we designed to take us in and out of the feedback regions. And the red is actually where we track. Now, that matches horribly, and you may say, well, you did a really horrible job with the control design. That may be the case, but the, the reason here is that this is our unstable subsystem. I, I don't have feedback at all. Um, so it's just really a function of how well my dead reckoning system is. Maybe I have a great dead reckoning system, and I can follow the trajectory really well, or maybe I don't. Um, but whatever it is, um, I've, I've characterized that in my model, and I built that into my timing conditions that tell me that I have to come in and out of the zone in a in particular amount of time so that I remain stable um, in my ability to track around the circle. And so this is the trajectory that that agent took. Um, here you can see there are periods where I'm in the feedback denied region and my errors grew, uh, but overall they converged, at least within some wall. And then um, there are periods where I'm in the green region, so I hit my threshold here, and then I, I went back to my green region, and now my observer error is decaying, and my overall errors are decaying, um, and, and I can show stability. So then we got over that discontinuity pickup that required us to uh, use an observer, and in this case, we just used a reset map meaning that um, whenever I got into the feedback region, I just immediately used my sensor information. I discontinuously switched to my, my, my feedback information, um, and I didn't have to wait for the observer to converge. So what that means is I can spend more time in my denied region because I don't have to come into my feedback region and spend time there ordering and dwelling there in order for my observer to converge before I left that region. Um, and so you can see here that I'm just kind of coming in and touching the circle and I'm spending more time um, tracking my trajectory on the, in the feedback deny region. And you see the same kind of trends here with my growth and decay. Um, then we investigated a problem that we called a relay explorer problem. And so this is really more aligned with that um, underwater problem that I was describing earlier. So now imagine that you've got an agent, an explorer, and they're in an area that's, that there's no feedback. Let's say they're in an underwater environment, and they're scanning, they're searching for something. Um, and I don't want them to leave that mission. I want them to stay doing that 100% of the time, okay? Um, and so then I'm gonna develop a relay agent and the relay agent is going to be like a data fairy. It's like not F-A-I-R-Y, but F-E-R-R-Y. So this is going to take the data back and forth between the green zone, which could be the surface of the water, or it could be like underneath the surface uh, vehicle where it's getting information from an acoustic modem. And it's basically going to go and, de and deliver the state information to the agents who are constantly in there to go maintain their exploring and never come back into the green region. Um, 
And for this one, uh, we also considered some uncertain dynamics to make it a little bit more fun. Um, so we have the relay agent with some uncertain dynamics. We've got the exploring agent. Um, the exploring agent will get uh, sensor information whenever the relay agent and the exploring agent are within inside the communication radius of the um, communicating agent. We have some desired trajectory, which is the exploring agent has some desired trajectory, like do a, do a sweeping pattern or some coverage pattern um, in the uh, feedback to high region. And um, for the uncertain dynamics here, for the relay agent, we use a neural network uh, to approximate, um, to do function approximation of those dynamics. Um, and so our um, estimator, so, um, so we have an estimate of the function, uh, which is the W hat, and then we also have estimated state information, the XR hat. Um, and so this is interesting in the sense that whenever I don't have feedback, then I don't have feedback to, to learn from either. And so uh, as my relay agent goes in and out of the feedback region, um, when it's outside the feedback region, it's not updating or learning the dynamics, but when it comes back into the feedback region, then I can, I can learn my dynamics. Um, so that's kind of an interesting uh, twist to this problem as well. And there's also an auxiliary trajectory for the relay agent that takes it from the feedback region to the region outside the feedback in order to provide information. So in a similar way that we had multiple air systems uh, in the previous problems, here we have similar kind of air systems uh, for these agents. The exploring agent has the actual tracking air dynamics, um, the estimated tracking air dynamics. So for example, it wouldn't know this one all the time because it doesn't know the actual error when it doesn't have feedback. Um, it will always have this one because it knows the desired trajectory and it has some estimate of where it is. Um, and likewise, it wouldn't have this one um, either because this is a mismatch between uh, the estimate which it knows and its current position which it doesn't know. Um, the relay agent um, has similar error systems um, as, as these, but it also has an estimation error um, in terms of the learning of the dynamics. Um, so we designed a controller. Um, it's just basically some high gain feedback, uh, feed forward the desired trajectory, and then have a neural network estimate of the dynamics. And then um, this XP, it switches between the actual state information when we have it and the estimate when we don't have it. And then this is our update ball, our observer essentially for our, um, for our state information um, with the estimated dynamics instead of the actual dynamics. Uh, and then a robust defining term. So um, we want to do fast learning, um, and it would be nice if we could, in fact, identify the dynamics um, eventually as well. And it's typically done in adaptive control through what's called persistence of excitation. You may have, you may be familiar with that. That's a very stringent condition uh, to try and meet, and you can't even verify that you meet it online. So instead of doing that, we also did this integral concurrent learning based on, it, it, it's a modification of concurrent learning strategies that Gurish uh, developed. Um, and it essentially uses uh, data, input-output data that you're concurrently collecting as you're executing a trajectory. And then you can use this input-output data to do system identification concurrently or at the same time as you're doing your execution. And because this is all in a summation, and you really just need to check whenever the summation becomes positive or definite, you don't know when that's going to happen, but you can check it online. And there are also some things that you can do to increase the eigenvalues of this uh, matrix and improve the chances of it becoming positive or definite. So you still need some sufficient amount of excitation uh, of your dynamics to learn them, but this provides a verifiable condition that you can check to see if you have, in fact, learned those dynamics. Um, and so we use this as our adaptation law, um, meaning that we have some continuous dynamics, um, um, some continuous learning, but we also have some, so here would be like a traditional adaptive update law, and then here we're appending the traditional adaptation law 
with our database learning. Um, so we just use a standard unicycle, um, and we use a reset map. So whenever we're in the feedback region, we discontinuously switch to um, update our estimate to the actual state information. Um, and so here's a video, obviously, when we don't have a relay agent. And so there's the relay agent, but it's not going to come on. Um, the green zone is in there. The mobile robot can't get in there. And so it's just dead reckoning trying to follow this circle. But it has no sensor information, so it does a horrible job. And if we let it go long enough, eventually it would, it would become unstable. It would just lose the trajectory altogether. Um, but then we turned on the relay agent. And so now the relay agent is going to be going back and forth between the green zone. And then it's going to provide data to the mobile robot, uh, ferrying the information back and forth. And you can see that the mobile robot stays on the desired path much better. In fact, we can certify that it will stay on the path with a certain tolerance um, by because of the use of this um, back and forth by the relay agent, where the timing of, the, of that uh, information is provided from uh, the, the timing conditions. And this is the trajectory that the exploring agent took and the relay agent took. And so the nice thing is that our exploring agent, which is always operating in a feedback denied region, um, is able to 100% of the time stay on uh, the, the mission objective. And we, then we can just use the relay agent to ferry information to it back and forth. Um, and then we can also extend this to having multiple exploring agents and some kind of a network. Um, so now we've got multiple agents that are trying to track some trajectories and the relay agent will switch both between the green zone and the red zone and will switch between the different agents uh, to make sure that each of them are staying on the path. And the switch systems analysis and our dwell time condition analysis will also tell us how many agents we can have. It gives us some kind of a scalability bound um, for this process to know that, hey, if you had five agents, you would need two relay agents, maybe. And this was the path that the relay agent took and, and, and the multiple exploring agents took. So then we're thinking about other, so those were simple circles where the distance between the green zone and the trajectory was always the same. It's a super <laughs> simplified problem. But now we're looking at problems where what if you're doing a more complicated trajectory where here's the green zone the relay agent is still going back in and out of the green zone to the mobile robot. But you can see that at certain points, the trajectory is close to the green zone. And then at other points, the trajectory is far away from the green zone. And so now, somehow, our um, timing conditions are going to be a function of not only convergence and divergence rates and, and timing, but it's also going to have to have the, the path and the trajectory of the agent somehow included as well. Um, and I say somehow included as well because we haven't quite figured out the math of this problem yet. We just did this video just to, to see you know, what would happen if we applied the stuff that we've already developed to us. Um, so there's a lot of ways to think about optimizing this problem and to um, extend uh, the ideas to that problem. Um, so in a similar way, um, we have this problem where we're developed an approximately optimal controller, meaning that we're going to learn the optimal policy online as I'm executing, um, and there's uncertainties in the system. So I'm learning about myself, I'm, I'm learning my optimal policy, and I have these obstacles that are coming in and out of my uh, field of view. Let me see if I can pause this for just a second. Okay. Um, so in that first video, what you saw was these uh, red virtual balls that were kind of floating around the, the autonomous agent. And the way we formulated the math in that problem is that each agent, each red ball, each obstacle um, was, had some state-dependent trajectory. And we found that we had to have um, function approximators, basis functions for all the obstacles we had to know. Um, what each of the obstacles were, how many obstacles we were going to have. And so that really 
was a terrible solution because you know I have to know how many obstacles and I have a huge computational expense of learning about each of the obstacles. And so instead of doing that, we reformulated the problem as a non-autonomous system, meaning that we have, instead of expressing it as a state-dependent thing, we express the obstacles as an explicit, just a time-dependent thing. And the problem there is that I'm trying to solve a, an optimal control problem, an infinite horizon optimal control problem, and doing that for a time-varying, uh, an explicit time-dependent system is intractable. And so then we came up with a way to take this time domain and re-express it back in the state domain through a, a novel transformation that allowed us to make the optimal control problem tractable. Um, but the advantage of, of doing that, oh, well, I guess we'll kind of go through the video again. Maybe. I should have never stopped it. Okay, we'll have to get back to this first part of the video again. Uh, yes. Um, so the advantage of doing this non-autonomous approach is that uh, I didn't have to keep up with how many obstacles are there, um, and I don't have to expend the computational resources to track each of the obstacles. And in fact, I can even have obstacles that um, we just give someone an Xbox controller and have them drive around one of the virtual obstacles and the quadcopter is able to avoid that. And so you'll see the same setup again. It starts in the corner, it wants to go to the yellow region, um, and now it's, it's planning a path around the obstacles in an optimal way. Um, but it's not having to learn about the individual obstacles as it does it. Um, and then here, uh, we're, we're flying there. One of the red balls, it's obvious which one, is being flown around by an Xbox controller. Um, so you can see the one ball here that's moving around quicker. Someone's just kind of driving that around to try and mess with the quadcopter. So. Um, so that was, in general, intermittent um, feedback. And the last example was you know, just intermittencies in, in obstacles that were coming in and out, which uh, we didn't know about the obstacles until we sensed them. So that was kind of the intermittent sensing part of it. But we also looked at um, intermittent imaging in particular. Um, and we asked ourselves, well, if I'm trying to track a target and it goes out of my field of view, what would I do about it? I mean, one kind of basic engineering approach is to do a zero order hold, meaning that when I don't see it, stop my estimator, pause my estimator until I see it again and then turn it back on. And then another approach that I might want to take is to build a predictor where I'm just speeding forward an estimate of the dynamics uh, to, to learn where I am. Um, so here's a video of a mobile robot that's going in and out of the field of view, and we are applying the zero order hold. Um, here is the uh, estimate of the, of the depth to the mobile robot. And you can see um, the blue is the actual trajectory, um, the green is our estimate, and then the red is um, the zero order hold. So whenever I can't see the target, that's the red points, and I'm just freezing it there. And my switching here is infrequent enough that the simple zero order hold is able to stabilize the system. And I was, I was able to check my timing conditions, and I was able to report that, hey, the observer is stable here, um, and then you could even see that. Um, but then we implemented the predictor, and we were able to, basically the predictor allows us to have less conservative estimates, or, or less conservative timing conditions, meaning that we can tolerate uh, faster switching or longer periods where the target is out of the field of view. And so you can see here the, the target kind of comes in and goes out of the field of view. This little picture up here is the estimate versus the true state. Um, in the beginning, that was off by a good bit. Now it's pretty much dialed into it, even when it goes out of the field of view. Um, then it's using a predicted learned model. Oh, well. Um, and so in this case, 
for that same video, we applied the zero order hold, but the switching was fast enough that it violated those timing conditions, and you can see that it's not stable at all. Um, and so we knew that it didn't meet the timing conditions, and then we would report to, to you know, some higher level person or machine that you can't trust their estimate. But with the predictor, because it um, softened our timing conditions, for that same scenario, it was able to, to um, be stable and do an excellent job of tracking. Another um, problem then that, that causes us to think about is we have this virtual road network, these mobile robots are moving on, and I have a quadcopter, and I want, so the quadcopter is obviously outnumbered, there, there's more mobile robots than there are quadcopters, and so either it can fly really high and keep them in the field of view, but that's not really desirable because I'll lose resolution and I'm having to fly very high, uh, and another way is it could just switch between them. And so what it does is it follows one of them around and learns the road network. And then after it learns the road network, then it switches between them. As you can see down here, so there's intermittency in the targets. Sometimes I'm watching one and I flip over to the other. And I'm able to build predictors that enable me to switch between these. Like for example, when I get to an intersection, I don't know which way the target's going to go. So when I'm at an intersection, I might want to switch over and look at that agent. But then when I'm on one of these long paths like that, there's really no need to go and look at them then because I know they're moving along that path and I can visit, I can stay with the other agent um, when it's maybe at an intersection point. And so this is the, the results from that video where here, uh, I'm following this agent in the beginning, so the green and blue are right on top of each other. And over here, um, my predictor isn't stable at all because I'm not even tracking this agent yet. I'm still learning the road network. But once I've learned the road network and then I switch to tracking this agent and then tracking that agent, which is the difference between the red and the blue with the predictor, then you can see that I'm able to track the position of both um, agents um, even though I'm having to switch between them in that way. Um, this is a picture that I showed in the very beginning where this is um, kind of a conventional approach which I'm required to keep this target in the field of view. And he, on, the, on the right, I'm exploiting the fact that I don't have to always have the target in my field of view. I can tolerate some amount of time where it's outside of my field of view. So I can design a smooth trajectory that just moves uh, to go around the target um, in some way that, that allows the target to leave the field of view. But I have to, based my timing conditions will tell me, ah, but you need to peek at it every so often. Um, and that will modify my trajectory in order to do that. So this is a really rough, fresh off the presses uh, video where we do that problem. You can see that we've lost the target. We drifted, so then we had to turn. Our timing condition said you need to look in and zero out your error, so it did that. We don't say we're to move along um, to the end goal and then reposition to the final spot that it was supposed to be at. Now, in my opinion, that's kind of a terrible looking video also, but at least it's not go forward, drive back, go forward, drive back, go forward, um, which is kind of a conventional solution. And here you can see uh, the trajectory that it took. And then uh, the final video I'll show, um, this is a problem where I'm also intermittently switching between agents that I'm sensing. Um, and uh, let me, so really quickly, these are just paper plates with construction paper on them. There's no motors, there's no sensors, it's just a paper plate. Um, the quadcopter's objective is to take the red ones and the green ones and move them into the center circle and uh, it has to switch between the agents in order to do that. Um, and its only influence over the agents is through the uncertain interaction dynamics, the aerodynamic forces that are pushing on it and the friction of it sliding on the floor. And so we're learning those interaction dynamics. So some are short plates, some are tall ones that have different weights, different characteristics. You see some kind of get picked up and pushed by the aerodynamics, other ones just kind of slide. So it achieves that task, and then we kind of hit a button and task it for the next objective, which I think is in this video, uh, which then 
it's supposed to come in here and push the pink ones back to one side and the yellow ones back to another side. Again, learning the interaction dynamics um, as, it, as it interacts with the agents. We call this a, a herding example, or we used to call it herding until I decided I didn't like that. You guys may like that being, being the bulls, but, um, but now we call it just um, an influential agent. <laughs> and so you'll see it sort the yellow and the, and the, and the pink. And it's kind of neat seeing them slide across the floor because at times they move just like a, a mobile robot would move, like they have motors and they know where they're supposed to go. Other times they just run away from you or lift up off the floor a little bit. Um, but whatever they do, the, the quadcopter will respond um, appropriately. Like this one's going to. I think one of them runs away, or maybe this video was a good video where one of them doesn't run away, so yay, success. Uh, it ran away, yeah, there it goes. Um, but it still will chase it down and make sure it goes into the circle. And uh, everything that you saw today was the fruits and, and labor uh, of the hard work by my students. And so I just want to you know, give them all the credit for the, for the stuff that you saw today. Um, so, we're proud of those guys for all the hard work they do. And thank you for your attention. Man.